Okay, participants, good afternoon. Participants are reminded of the following. The webinar link is for participants personal use only. Log in using your full name. Do not share nor post the link on social media. Please refrain from clicking any icons on your screen. And also, please remain your microphones muted all throughout the webinar because it could, um, it could um, affect our um, speaker. And let yourself be recognized by the moderators before turning on your audio so that you will not interrupt the speaker. And flashed on your screen as well is our program flow that we have to follow and to keep track of our time. At this point, may I request everyone for a moment of silence. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Almighty and ever-loving God, we glorify and thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet online and share our knowledge and time with one another in this webinar. We humbly ask you to shower our speaker today of your greatest inspiration so that he may share the most of his knowledge, heart, and soul. May he be blessed as he continues to bring his expertise to people who need them. May we also be living witnesses of your genuine love through the enactment of the knowledge acquired through this webinar. Amen. So good afternoon once again, Bayotans. I am Ellen P. Enoch. I am your host for today's webinar, and I am streaming live from Davao City. So with me also are our Facebook moderators. We have Ms. Miraflor and Ding, and for our Zoom moderator, we have Sir John Paul M. Banzon. And um, no, uh, take, please take note, participants, that we are streamed live via our Facebook page at Bayota Philippines Davao. Also, participants, you maybe you may encounter a slight delay on the Facebook live feed. So, but rest assured that your questions later will be um, will be entertained by our Facebook moderator, Mamira Flor Randing. And at this point, we would like you to welcome to this third webinar series of Biology Teachers Association Davao chapter with the theme, Raising Awareness and Bridging the Gaps Toward Nation Building and Better Science Education. Bayotans, this webinar will cover various aspects of the science of life to better inform our teachers, students, and biology enthusiasts on the trend of biology education in the country. This third webinar series is entitled Beyond the Study of Life, Gender Integration in the Teaching of Biology. The topic is really interesting, right? So um, I hope that we will listen and we'll focus on to our, um, to our speaker of this afternoon. So to, form, to formally open our webinar, um, let me call on our um, board of director for the secondary level, Dr. Jose Marie E. Ocdenaria for his opening remarks. To my colleagues in the academe, Bayota Davao officers and members, and to all Bayotans, welcome and good afternoon. School is one of the institutions which display several angles of gender issues. In fact, Many studies show the similar matters of inequalities in the academic arena and many amounts of adjustment is still needed if impartiality between or equal opportunities, especially the strategies to be used. It is really a big challenge to teachers like us to cater the different needs of the students. Sometimes, we teachers forget to give importance to gender to the gender of our students further the amalgamation of gender sensitive teaching strategy remains to be a challenging among uh, to be a challenge among educators indeed this social issue requires more in-depth exploration especially in the classroom to promote its significance and determine its applicability and effectiveness. Studies suggest that gender responsive teaching approach be integrated in the classroom to promote gender equality, 
and contribute to the improvement of learners' academic achievement. This afternoon, we will be more enlightened as our distinguished speaker will share about gender integration that is highly contextualized to science teaching, specifically in biology. This is the third webinar episode highlighting the awareness and bridging the gaps toward nation building and better science education. To all of us, may we find this webinar fruitful and meaningful. Once again, welcome and good afternoon. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ocdenaria. So before we proceed to the introduction of our plenary speaker, allow me to reiterate some of the following guidelines for today's webinar. Participants are highly encouraged to participate by typing questions in the chat box. You may post a question during the talk. However, it will only be answered during the open forum. In addition, selected participants will be allowed to ask their questions using the raised hand function. Another, certificates will also be issued to registered participants once evaluation form is fully accomplished after the webinar series. And lastly, certificates will be emailed to registered and validated participants within two weeks after this webinar. So I hope that we will follow our set of guidelines. I know that we are all excited to hear the talk of our plenary speaker for this afternoon. To formally introduce our resource speaker, allow me to pass the screen to our Bayota Dabao Chapter Board of Director for the tertiary, tertiary level, none other than Mr. John Paul M. Banzon. Thank you, ma'am. Um, our speaker for this afternoon is a biology teacher, public information officer, and gender and development focal person in Davao Oriental State College of Science and Technology in the city of Mati, Davao Oriental. He recently bagged the Presidential Award for Excellence in Service, recognition of his work commitment, and notable contribution to the college. To obtain a bachelor's degree in secondary education, major in biological science as magna cum laude, and class valedictorian in DOS CST and now a candidate of Master of Science in Biology in Ateneo de Davao University. As a God practitioner and advocate, he specializes on the biological perspective of sex and gender. He developed the God Code of Compostela Valley State College and continuously assists various women's group, indigenous communities, barangays, basic and higher education institutions, youth organizations, and non-government organizations in their God mainstreaming efforts. Meanwhile, being an early career researcher, he has conducted several studies on wildlife ecology, gender responsive biodiversity conservation, and gender mainstreaming, which he was able to present and publish in international, national, and local platform. He is often invited as speaker lecturer and technical consultant on gender and development, youth empowerment, campus journalism, and student leadership. Let us welcome my colleague, a classmate, and a good friend of mine, Mr. Jonel P. Villegas. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Sir Paul. No, indeed, you are a good friend. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'd like to Take this opportunity to thank Bayota Davao, especially to our president, Dr. De Las Liagas, and of course the rest of the team for giving me the chance to speak here on gender integration in the teaching of biology. My due respect also to our college president, Dr. Edito B. Sumile, and of course to our VP for RDE, Dr. Roy Ponce. Uh, Director for Research, Dr. Misael Clapano, and of course to my colleagues in the Gender and Development Center of DOSCST, who are also with us this afternoon. My due respect to Dr. Geraldine Sacro, our Director for the Gender and Development Center, and of course my co god focal person, Dr. Maryfield M. Baguya. Uh, once again, I am very thankful to everyone who attended this webinar entitled Beyond the Study of Life, 
gender integration in the teaching of biology. So if you have heard my introduction a while ago, uh, just a short disclaimer, um, I have no formal schooling on gender and development. My theoretical trainings and academic background is really into science education and of course biology. But uh, because of my designation here in the OSCST, which started in Compostela Valley State College, I have been working with the gender and development for almost four years now as a practitioner and advocate of gender and development. So that is why uh, in our gender and development center, we tried to tailor fit also our expertise, our specializations to what we do in the center. So in my case, because I am a biology teacher and a biologist, I am in charge or I specialize in explaining or discussing the biological perspectives of sex, sexuality, and gender. So this is something that we usually do, especially when, when, when we conduct trainings, whether here in Davao Oriental or outside Davao Oriental. Anyways, this afternoon, I will be talking about beyond the study of life, gender integration in the teaching of biology. So for very, very long, we have considered biology as a discipline-bound study of life. And most of the time, we think about it as an isolated uh, discipline. That is why this afternoon, I would like to share to you how do we integrate gender in teaching biology. So first, we will talk about the basic concepts and definitions of sex and gender. And then I will share to you what are the gender issues in the classroom that will lead us to believe why is, is there a need to integrate gender in biology teaching. And of course, I will be sharing to you the framework on gender inclusive biology curri curriculum and the call to actions beyond the study of life to our biology teachers who are with us in this webinar series. Okay, so let's start with sex. No? We will differentiate sex and gender first so that we will have a common understanding and definition about these terms and we can use this as a springboard for our discussion. Foremost, uh, let me share to you this definition of sex, which states that it refers to the biological characteristics, which includes the genetics, anatomy, and physiology that, of course, generally define humans as female or male. Of course, we biologists, we know that there are rare, rare cases of individuals who possess the two sexes, but it's a biological abnormality. So in this case, Biologically speaking, we have two sexes, the female and the male. So what are the reasons for these sexes? Of course, there are different biological factors that will determine whether you are a male or a female. And first on the line, that is our testosterone, which is actually present in, male, in men and male animals, but also in women, but only in low concentrations. That is why the high levels of testosterone in males and even male animals. These are responsible for the development of secondary male sexual characteristics. For example, the deepening of the voice or let's say the appearance of the pubic hair. But there are also studies which actually relate high testosterone levels to aggression. And this explains why men tend to be more aggressive compared to women, or males are more aggressive compared to females. And this is in fact uh, grounded on scientific evidence. Uh, there were studies in the past wherein they tried to compare, uh, elevate the testosterone concentrations among white female mice. So with the uh, elevated testosterone levels of the white female mice, they found out that the one group with elevated testosterone levels, they became more aggressive in terms of their behavior. And, then, and the control group, which were the non-elevated levels of testosterone, they remained as is. So they found a significant difference in terms of behavior. And that's, they say, in conclusion, it's related to aggression. Another thing is, when we speak of testosterone, it also induces the masculinization of the brain. So when we say masculinization of the brain, and that entails aggression, competitiveness, 
visuospatial abilities, and of course, higher sexual drive. On the other hand, when we speak of estrogen, of course, estrogen now is present among females, but they're also present among males. Only that the presence of estrogen among males is only at a low level. That's why, uh, and the role of the estrogen now, these are the different effects of high estrogen in the body of a female. But I'd like to highlight you here, uh, estrogen is actually responsible for the growth and shape, uh, shaping of the breast of females, which technically differentiates what's a male and a female based on our biological behavior, biological characteristics. So of course, our physical characteristic now, we can really observe by just uh, plainly looking that females have larger breasts compared to men. And that is because of biological factors, in this case, specifically the estrogen. Let me also share to you this human genome. No? So just a, sh a short review on biology 101. We have 46 chromosomes in our body and that's 23 pairs. What's interesting is our 23rd pair of the chromosome, which we actually call the sex chromosomes. So for the sex chromosomes, that's XX for female and XY for male. So the major difference there is the Y chromosome. So what's in the Y chromosome? Why are there, uh, why do we have sexual dimorphism among humans? What sets the difference between the two sexes? When it comes to human genome, the chromosomes, what's the, the main difference is set by the 23rd chromosome. So what's in the 23rd chromosome? We have this so-called the master switch. If you, can, if you can see in here, the blue band, that is what we call the sex determining region Y gene or the SRY gene, which we now term to be the master switch. As such, with the presence of the SRY gene in the Y chromosome, it will now dictate the development of the male reproductive system. Otherwise, if the SRY gene is not present, then female development will continue. As a matter of fact, in humans, it is said that embryonic development is female programmed. That is why it's only a matter of the master switch. So if the master switch is present, you have the, fem you have the male. But if the master switch is absent, automatically the default now is female. That is why there are phenomenon that we call as transsexualism, wherein there is truncated version of the SRY gene, which now results to different sexual alterations. For example, if there is a translocation of SRY gene to the X chromosome, so you now have XX, supposed to be these are females, but it turned out that they become males, XX males, because of the translocation of the SRY gene to the X chromosome. Another case would be the disappearance of the SRY gene in the Y chromosome. So if you have an XY here, meaning to say these should be male, however, with the disappearance because of that a truncated version of the SRY gene, you will now have the XY females. And this phenomenon, we call this as transsexualism. By the way, this is different from what we call uh, transgenderism or transgender. So later we will also discuss what's the difference between the two. Anyways, that is about sex. And to cut the long story short, when we talk about sex, then that refers to your biological characteristics that define you as a male or a female. And that is why, because humans are sexually dimorphic, we also assume different sex roles, such that, let's say, pregnancy or lactation are, the, uh, are among the sex roles of females. And these, cannot be for, and these are functions that cannot be performed by males. On the other hand, let's say the males, we are the ones who produce the sperm cell and therefore fertilizes the egg. Or So that's also our sex role. The sex role that can only be performed by one sex because of our biological, physiological, and anatomical differences. So with this statement alone, we can always say that 
we need both males and females for reproduction. Therefore, we are all equal. Uh, we are all equally important in the society. So if this is our case, this is our mindset, there would be no problem. However, where do the concept of inequality comes in? It is through our concept of gender. So what is gender now? Gender, to simply put it, this is a social cultural expression, meaning to say it is dictated upon by the community, by the society where we belong. And this refers to the different characteristics and roles that are associated with certain groups of people with reference to their sex and sexuality. Which means to say that if you are a male, the society now will assign you with different roles, different expectations, different norms and behavior that is expected to demonstrate that you are expected to demonstrate because you are a male. Or on the other hand, when you are born female, the society will also give you expectations, roles, behaviors that are also appropriate for females. And that belongs to our concept of gender. Meaning to say, gender is being dictated upon by the society and the community where we belong. And gender is not fixed. If sex is fixed, it's, it's natural. It cannot be altered in natural ways. Gender, on the other hand, is dynamic. It changes from time to time. So it could be that our concept of gender now in the Philippines is this, but later on, our concept of gender will change. And there have been many examples in the past. For example, I, in the past, I will not mention a certain tribe, but in the past, there is a certain tribe somewhere in Northern Luzon where in their practice is women, they usually go uh, half naked, meaning to say they expose their breasts. Because that is an indication if you are already uh, ready to be married, if you have, the, uh, if you have large breasts. So the, the main basis now, the main premise now is if you have large breasts, you should expose your breasts because if your breasts are now large enough, you can be married. And it is a culture that has changed drastically over the past years. Because now, who would dare to be half naked among us? Especially, definitely none, especially women. Okay? As I have said, gender can change from time to time. And gender can also differ from culture to culture. I remember there's also this certain tribe somewhere in Africa, wherein they practice circumcision among females. Imagine, uh, in the Philippines, we do circumcision among males. But this circumcision alone is also a cultural taboo among other cultures. So that explains the dynamism and the relativism of gender concepts as well. As I have said, there's also this culture in somewhere in Africa, which practice the culture of circumcision among females. And they call it vaginal mutilation. In, in the practice of vaginal mutilation, they cut the clitoris of the females by using sharpened bamboo sticks or some bamboo scissors. Scientifically speaking, it would be unhygienic and it could pose several threats, especially health risks among females. But later on, because there have been uh, members of the community, members of the tribe have been educated and they fought well, Vaginal mutilation has eventually stopped. So this is an example that gender can actually, and our concept of gender generally, is dynamic. It can change from time to time. It can also change across cultures. Anyways, why do we have a concept of gender? Or why do we have gender? Now, this is also our uh, misunderstanding or misconception. The common misconception is that when we speak of gender and development, it's only for females or it's only for LGBT. No, gender and development because it is, or it includes all genders, whether you are a straight male, a straight female, or you belong to LGBT, you are included in the gender and development. So why do we have gender? Uh, that means to say that each one of us, we all have our gender. So where are all these coming from? Well, 
Learning of gender roles begin in the early stages of childhood. That means to say that since we are young, we have been learning, accumulating our concept of gender. And therefore, when we become adults, just like this one right now, we are already adults, we have our set of gender roles that no matter how hard we try to change, it's somehow fixed at a certain level. So how does this system perpetuate? This is through the process of socialization. Meaning to say, when a child is born and the child socializes with his or her family, and that is the start already of our learning of gender. Therefore, please allow me to mention several agents of socialization, which I think play a vital role in the development of one's gender. And that includes number one, our family. Second, the school. That's why we will be talking here how to integrate gender in biology teaching. And of course, media. In the family, for example, in child rearing, when a child is born and it's a girl, I don't know, uh, it's cultural, but we always give pink gifts. Or we always give uh, pink dresses, pink cribs, everything is pink, if it's a girl. But if it's a boy, it's a different color, it's blue. This is now the start of gender orientation. Uh, this is now the start how children learn about gender. And that starts with child rearing in the family. Next, we have these verbal appellations, telling children what they are and what is expected of them. When you wake up early in the morning and then you hear your mother or your father nagging, it's a different yao yao when we talk about females. Yao yao bitaw ng ginikanan, tos babae. So what, what will the mothers or the fathers usually say? Ikaw yung bayhana ka. Di ka kabalo mang limpyo, di ka kabalo mang luto, di ka kabalo mang, mang laba. Kung saan na lang sunod, ugmaminyo ka. O, diba? So that would say that women, you're expected to do the cooking, to do household chores, to do the cleaning, to do the laundry. Because since we are young, we are told to do so. In the same way, males are also victims of this verbal appellation. And which also explains why there are more women now who enroll in, let's say, nursing or education. And then there are men, more men in the fields of, let's say, engineering or criminology. Which will bring me to my next point, which is canalization. Directing attention to gender appropriate objects. So when your, let's say, inaanak is a female, what do you usually give? It's always dress, color pink, or doll, or let's say cook set. But if it's a male, we usually give cars or toy guns. So from then on, there is this certain divide that dolls are for women and guns are for men. And this is a start of learning gender roles. Lastly, I would also like to share with you manipulation. When we handle boys and girls different, differently, even as infants, let's say the baby girl comes crying to you, uh, and you would say, "Ah, oh, kaluoy sa akong baby." But if it's a male or a baby boy that comes crying, you would say, "Ay ayo gila kaya mga lalaki di mo hila, bayot ng muhila." So you see, there's a big difference, and that that is manipulation. You are manipulating manipulating children to behave based on your expectations of their gender. No? Because you are a male, then you should not cry. Or because you are a female, then you can cry. And that sets a very big difference among us. Another thing is in media, or social media, for example. We can also learn our gender roles in social networking sites. But there are, there are games now applications that are intended for females, for baby girls. And these are, uh, the games are usually uh, colored pink. And then usually the, the game is cooking, cooking. But males usually um, counter strikes or with the use of guns. And unknowingly, this already forms part of 
our children's learning about gender roles. Even in televisions, when we see advertisements in televisions, why are all the commercial endorsers of shampoo, or if not all, majority of the endorsers of shampoo, they're all, they're all females. Buti na ngayon, meron na siyang mga males. So they're all females with long hair. Up to the extent that we males, we don't like to use pantin because it's color pink and the advertisement, the commercial endorser is a female. So you see uh, how media influences our orientation of what is gender. And that goes, uh, that goes through even with radio and print media. And lastly, I would like to share with you, of course, I'd like to uh, deepen our understanding how our schools can influence our gender learning. First, we have a gendered classroom. No? Admit it or not, but in the classroom, we always segregate. No? Most of the time, especially among basic education um, students or pupils, we usually segregate males and females. And even in assigning cleaners, uh, cleaners like in public school, when we assign cleaners, we assign women to reproductive roles. We assign them to uh, slightly less hard jobs. But when it comes to males, we assign them to hard labors like uh, they, they fetch water. So there are, there are things that even us teachers in schools, we influence how we shape how our students, our pupils view or learn gender. Stereotype textbooks, example, uh, the modules that our children are now studying at home, have we checked whether they are sensitive or not in, when it comes to gender? So there are stereotype textbooks, like uh, there are textbooks that would, that would say that ang ama ang haligi ng tahanan or ang ina ang ilaw ng tahanan. But there are instances wherein these females, they become the haligi ng tahanan or these males, they become the ilaw ng tahanan. But because we are biased, we are stereotyping and then we tend to think that females can only be ilaw ng tahanan and males can only be haligi ng tahanan. That is why most of the time, if the husband or if the wife has a better salary pay than the husband, it becomes a problem in the traditional fa Filipino family setup. Because we'll always go back to our stereotype that males should provide income for the family. And where did we learn all these things? They, we start learning them from our family and also from the media and from school. Teacher expectations. We have higher expectations to female achievers, for instance. And we would just say for males, we will just say nga ay, bugoy man niya, siguro niya ka graduate. And this is true. Maraming mga lalaki, ginaing na nato nga di ka graduate because of kabugoy whatsoever. And this becomes part of our teacher expectations. And we are already biased. So this means to say that most of our decisions inside the class, if not all of our decisions, are actually based on gender. No? If we see that our students are more females, there are more females in our class, or there are more males in our class, then our strategies in the classroom, our teaching strategies should also change. And of course, peer pressure. No? peer pressure, what our friends are doing in school. Of course, uh, if you can see, there are factions inside our class. The males will tend to group with one another and the females will group with one another as well. So if you are a male and then you want to go with the female group, that becomes a problem because you will be labeled as gay. Or if you are a female and then you go with the male group, that becomes a problem because if you will not be labeled as a lesbian, will be labeled as a gat or you will be labeled as a whore, or, or maybe flirt, okay? So this is where our concept of inequality comes in. If you can check, our concept of inequality is based on our concept of gender. That is why we have this so-called gender inequality. 
Now, as biology teachers, we possess the knowledge to really change this mindset. No? So how do we integrate the biosocial perspectives in our understanding of gender? Uh, let me share to you three, three factors. One is gene environment interplay. Second, gene environment interaction. And third, epigenetics. Meaning to say, we should see gender not only as a social phenomenon, but also as a biological phenomenon. So as biologists, we know that a certain person behaves or acts like that, or a, a certain person has a phenotype like that, because that is an interplay and interaction of the genes and the environment which the certain person possesses. And that is true to our students as well. Our student is like that, maybe because biologically speaking, there are factors that contribute and the environment that nourishes the child upon growing up, up until now, is enabling the child to behave like that. Meaning to say, to cut the long story short, we should understand a person. We should try to comprehend a person from a biosocial perspective. And it's always a combination of biological and social factors. We do not know how much our biology is contributing to the environment or how much our environment is contributing to biology leading to what we are right now. But what we know that is that both of them are actually useful. And both of them could be better inputs, could be good inputs, so we could understand the totality of a person. And that is what we mean by we say gender and development. Because it does not end there. It should not end with our understanding of gender. There is this concept of development. So how do we contribute to gender and development? Let us check the different issues in the biology classroom. No? There is some recognition that most scientists are men. As a matter of fact, uh, there was this activity. No? I, learned, I learned about this activity online and tried to apply it in one of my classes. I tried to ask my students to draw a scientist. No? So the instruction was just to draw a scientist. And interestingly, most of my students draw or drew a male scientist. That's why their concept of scientists, uh, from that simple activity, we can, we can say that their concept of scientists is a male. Therefore, science courses like biology is for or are for males. It's male dominated because we're seeing it from a masculine perspective. And this also holds true why women are underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM in general. They say, now according to studies, that there is this so-called leaky pipeline phenomenon or leaky pipeline syndrome. Meaning to say the pipeline has certain leaks and women get excluded in the process because of the certain leaks. And the pipeline holds true is applicable among women. Why? It's progressive and persistent. Meaning to say, as we go higher, let's say from elementary, high school, college, and then postgraduate, as we go higher the pipeline, we will see more and more exclusion of women. We will see more and more exclusion among women. And this is persistent even with the efforts that we have been doing in the past. So sad to note that there are more women who do not survive in STEM, who are not interested in STEM because of this leaky pipeline syndrome. More than half of biology majors are women. But they say among the STEM disciplines, biology is the only discipline wherein there are more women. Uh, so this is good to note because they, uh, according to studies, women are abundant in the biology discipline. But despite this, Gender gaps among men and women are still evident despite the, the higher population of women in the biology discipline. There is this study conducted by uh, COCOT in the year 2018. 
uh, he tried to observe the behavior of boys and girls in a biological experimental setup, no? in a biology experiment setup. So they found out, no? the team found out that girls demonstrate attentive behavior, while boys, they demonstrated attention-seeking behavior. And when it comes to the apparatuses that they operate, girls, they usually operate household appliances, while boys, they usually operate technical appliances. So what does this mean? Even our gender role, social gender construction at homes are demonstrated in, an ex in a biology experimental setup. So that would mean to say that the, the roots of our social gender construct is actually deep enough to even manifest in a controlled environment. Next, we also have male biology students consistently underestimate female peers. So there are more male biologists na ang paningin sa female biologists are not equal or unequal. So we are not equal. Okay? But this is in the past. And there are also studies that said male students in undergraduate introductory bio biology courses are outperforming females at test time. So they're outperforming females. Does this mean that females generally have lower IQ than males? Of course not. But what are the factors that contribute to this outperformance or underperformance among women? So this is something that we can answer in our own classrooms. And of course, female scientists collaborate differently from their male counterparts. Even when it comes to fundings, there are studies that more research funds are given to male scientists compared to female scientists. So the bottom line here is gender forms a fundamental part of biology classrooms. Whether we like it or not, we will encounter gender in our classroom. And the truth about gender is our students are also gender diverse, meaning to say they have diverse gender orientations. And this would call for inclusive yet diversified teaching approaches. Meaning to say you should see to it, we should see to it as biology teachers that no students are left behind. But to do this, we need to diversify our teaching approaches. So there is no room for us to misgender our students. Another thing or another reason why we need to integrate gender in teaching biology is because biology provides a profound scientific understanding of sex, sexuality, and gender. So as I have said, we biologists, we have strong scientific knowledge on sex, sexuality. So we are a bit closer of understanding really what does gender mean? So when we advocate gender now, medyo konti na lang yung kulang because we already know the strong, uh, we already have a strong scientific background about, about it. Another thing is because translational biology is an emerging pedagogy. So even in our classroom, we will not limit biology or explaining biology based on biological perspectives alone. To cater the interests of our students, we can only use biology as a baseline, but we will try to, as much as possible, relate it into a real-world setup. And that is how we, that is also one uh, way to motivate our students to learn better when it comes to biology. And of course, there is now an increasing demand for a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach in teaching. Gone are the days na pag biology, biology lang. So when you study the microscope, it's only the microscope. No. Now we should relate it to social issues. Now we should relate it to political issues. So the next time that we talk about or we explain, let's say, human sex determination, or the next time that we explain biodiversity, for example, we should also relate it to diversity among humans. So in that, would be, in that way, it could be more relatable to our students. And we should inculcate among them that diversity is an integral part of, is an important part of the, 
of the discipline. So we cannot do away with diversity. And diversity is actually good. And that would mean that gender diversity could also be good. So that's one way how we can relate it. Now, we should also integrate teaching uh, bio, uh, gender in biology teaching because there are mandates about it. Huh? As a matter of fact, uh, gender and development is highly mainstream and institutionalized among educational institutions. For DepEd schools, if you have not read this one, please read uh, DepEd Order Number 32 Series of 2017. And of course, for HEIs, we should refer to Chad Memorandum Order Number 1 Series of 2015. Both of these orders actually dictate or provide basis on how do we establish gender and development in our respective institutions. So for us here in DOSCST, of course, our main basis is CHED Memorandum CMO number one series of 2015. And this also means that being in the gender and development, we should cut across the trilogical functions of higher education. And that should include instruction, curriculum, research, extension, and even production. So our efforts in the gender and development should not be limited in the curriculum only. We should also do research. We should also do extension works. And of course, production works and relate it to gender. So that is how we mainstream gender in the higher education sphere. Now, let me show to you a concrete example on the importance of integrating gender in, bio, in biology as a discipline. So let's take, let's try to take a look at this TB and gender. So this is published by DOH and USA. They found out based on certain epidemiological data that more Filipino males likely die because of tuberculosis or TB, more than females. So based on this, this is just sex disaggregated data. So they just tried to compare how many males, how many females die out of TB. And because of this, they found out that there are more males. So what are the factors that contribute to more males dying from TB? Let me ask some questions. Between Filipino males and Filipino females, who will more likely get a chest x-ray? It's females who will more likely see a doctor for two-week calf, pag sunod-sunod na yung ubo, who will more likely consult a doctor? It's the females. Who will more likely do nothing or self-medicate? It's the males. So that is why they try to neglect, they try to self-medicate, and that is why most of them die out of TB. So because of this gender knowledge, we are talking about tuberculosis here, and we are seeing it, from a health perspective, but the message now is we should not see it from, a, from the health perspective only, but we should also see it from a social perspective, and in this case, from a gender perspective. So what can we do? Males, they will say it is just a simple cough. So how can we make him care? We should talk about severity of a two-week cough to them and the dangers of self-medication. Sabihin mo, ay, bye. Pag two weeks na galing ubo, medyo delikado na siya. So that would say, uh, that would mean something. Or males would say, I don't want to miss work. So we could reach out to him in his workplace. Or for example, I don't have the time. I am too busy. So you can tell him, counsel him to find a trust in a treatment partner because he is not alone. Or masig maulaw kay na ITB. So you can counsel him as your friend. Or I do not want to be perceived as weak because as a, as a man, as male, I should be masculine. I should be strong. So a simple cough should not kill me. But we males are not immune to diseases, especially we are not immune to TB. So we can encourage him to be resilient, stay strong, and to not lose hope. So males, we can also be weak sometimes. And males, we can also cry sometimes. No? We can also cry. Okay? How about COVID data? 
Let's try to check because this is uh, trending. Gender and COVID-19. In our general efforts, now this is published by the World Health Organization. Surprisingly, according to WHO, there is limited availability of sex and age disaggregated data thus hampering analysis of the gendered implications of COVID-19 and the development of appropriate responses. Of course, when we speak of COVID-19, we cannot only think about vaccines. We should think about social factors regarding the success of our treatment initiatives or our quarantine initiatives. As a matter of fact, when we declare different quarantine protocols. These quarantine protocols are gender blind, meaning to say we did not try to consider gender in the declaration. No? So we tried to check or we, we viewed COVID-19 as a health phenomenon, as a health problem, but not a social problem. And this is the case. Most of the time we fail because we fail to see the social aspect of this health problem. Like for example, health and social workers face increased risk and vulnerability. Worldwide, there are around 70% of the workforce in the health and social work who are women. So that would mean to say that there are more women who are more exposed to COVID-19 compared to males. Plus, when we declared quarantine protocols, we limited also the access, if not really prohibited, the access to sexual and reproductive health and rights for women and girls. Now, as a matter of fact, maglisod ka as kang pwede ug napkin. Now, that is a basic, that, that's a basic need. But do we give sanitary napkins in our ayuda or in our relief operations? We do not. Because we only care about the, the canned goods and the rice, which is good, which is actually right. But how about sex, access to sexual and reproductive health? When you get pregnant during COVID-19, or even up to now, it's very difficult for you to go to hospitals. So do we, have in a, do we have mechanisms so that these women can be assisted when they go to the hospitals? Another thing is violence against women and children increases during lockdown. But this is a bit ironic because according to PNP, we have less bouncy cases during quarantine. So they tried to check it, they tried to dig deeper, and what they found out is there are less bouncy cases because these bouncy cases are underreported. You can see, uh, women cannot even report during a pre-COVID period. How much more during a period when there is more restrictions? when it comes to traveling. So that tightened their access to reporting their VAUSI cases. So what the bottom line here is, we should create a framework for including gender in our curriculum, in, the bi in biology curriculum. So this is a framework for a gender inclusive biology curriculum by Long in 2019, which I would like to share to you this afternoon. First uh, is about authenticity continuity, affirmation, anti-oppression, and student agency. So as teachers, we should be authentic. How can we be authentic? Number one, we should include gender, embed gender in the curriculum. And lessons should be aligned with the teacher's beliefs. And of course, content is based on empirical research. We do not uh, just drop names or we do not just create facts that should be based on empirical research so when we integrate gender as well in our curriculum we should integrate gender let's say just a simple statistics how many women are all right just a simple statistics how many women are let's say in your class or how how many men are in your class Okay, that's sex disaggregated data. Next one is about continuity, meaning to say when you include gender, it should not be a very special lesson or just a one-time lesson. It should recur from time to time in your classroom curriculum, in your biology curriculum. Another thing is we should also affirm, we should empower our students 
so that they can learn about the naturally occurring diversity of gender and sexuality in human and non-human species. That's why from our classes, from our discussions, they should learn that diversity of gender is normal and diversity of gender is good, even the diversity of sexuality. And we should celebrate diversity. Next, anti-oppression. So our lesson should highlight and challenge oppression in the current and historical science practices. Meaning to say, we should ask our students about their voices, what can they say about a certain issue, health issue, political issue, social economic issue, and how can we resolve it based on your perspectives. So that's one way of empowering them. And that's also one way of our learner, learners taking ownership of their own learning process. Meaning to say, we should also include student agency in the framework so that the students can give input and feedback about our lessons. And they can make choices out of their own, regardless of their gender, whether they are male or female, they have the liberty to choose how, when, and why to learn. Okay, I'm down to my uh, last slides. Let me also share to you the gender integration continuum. So it's a continuum uh, we could assess now in what particular stage of the continuum, continuum are we in, in our biology classes. So how does your work address gender? How do you address gender inside your class? Do you ignore gender norms? Wala kang pakialam sa gender. So you are gender blind. But you become gender aware through, let's say, if you reinforce or take advantage of inequitable gender norms, meaning to say you're exploitative. You're exploiting because you are the ones nga, ad, ayoko papasukin ang bata kasi long hair ka. You should not have long hair because you are a male. So when you say that in your class, you become exploitative. You're exploiting the rights of your students. Or if you just work around existing norms, you're just accommodating. Or you could be transformative as a teacher. Meaning to say, we could foster critical examinations of gender norms. We could strengthen equitable gender norms. And we could change these gender no norms. And the end goal is for us to have gender equality. So as biology teachers, as I have said, we could be advocates and practitioners of gender equality. Okay, so just a short checklist. This is not complete, but I just included this so that you can also reflect in your own classes. Let's say, in integrating gender in the curriculum, we could always integrate gender in the objectives, methodologies, and even in the assessment. And even if we do not, uh, we do not mention that we are including gender, we can include gender. For example, in the objectives, do you consider gender to be an integral part of the cognitive, psychomotor, and affective domains of learning? Meaning to say, if you include gender as an objective, are you considering it uh, in the cognitive psychomotor and not only affective? Because most of the time, we just refer to the affective domain if it's a social, uh, social issue. If it's gender, then we just say inculcate the values or respect of gender equality, which only caters affective domain. But how about the cognitive and the psychomotor? Or have you devo devoted at least one session to gender dimension of the course topic. In terms of methodologies, do you make your students more aware about gender stereotypes connected to the field that you are teaching? No? When you introduce the father of biology or the father of genetics, do you also recognize the powerful women who work in the field of biology? That's a good question that we could address. Or are you stimulating both genders to work in gender mixed groups when we group do we exclude males or exclude females or do we mix them? And then in our assessment, we can also use gender sensitive language and visual materials while designing an assessment tool. Or do you, do you give timely gender sensitive feedback on students learning? Or baka naman sabihin mo, ah, because you are a male, you're not expected to study hard. Oh, you become gender insensitive. So I hope you could reflect on this. So this is my final slide. This are, these are now the call to actions beyond the study of life. 
Let me just reiterate that we biology teachers have a unique opportunity to change the school climate by teaching in a way that includes and affirms diverse gender identities. We could incorporate gender in our teaching learning process. And as biology teachers, we already have the scientific knowledge, the biological knowledge about sex and sexuality. We just have to relate it to gender. And that's it. Schools are major contexts for social, uh, gender socialization. So we should remember that if you are sensitive, if you are gender responsive, we should consider this as, as teachers, we influence our students that much. That's why every word that we say, it has an impact to our students. And, sorry, uh, teachers must be able, we should be able to notice gender patterns inside our class. Uh, the, the good thing about being gender sensitive is we can now notice, let's say our males are not doing well. So what's the reason? Let's say in the new normal, uh, have we considered that a home learning, distance learning, or modular learning actually magnifies traditional gender roles at home. So if we demand on females, let's say demand subject, uh, if we demand activities to females, because they're at home, they're expected to do household chores. So they have very limited time to do it. So that could be one factor that we, we could incorporate in designing activities, even in the new normal. All right, so... I think that would be all. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you learned something from my talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Sir Janelle, for that very inspiring and challenging, no, as a teacher, na, um, challenging talk about um, gender and development. So um, my takeaway for your, from your talk, Sir Janelle, is that teachers as we are, we need to somehow shift our conventional images of gender concepts, especially to our students, to a more accepting, and accepting climate, which eliminates inequalities in all aspects. So if education is for all, right? Therefore, it should also be true to all gender preferences. Our society is evolving. So the Philippine norm is already reshaping into a more embracing and welcoming culture. So with this, we also need to promote a classroom atmosphere equal to all gender. And that is a great challenge for us biology teachers. Okay, so at this point, um, we will have our open forum. So for the mechanics, participants may type in your questions in the chat box and please use the raise hand function, which is found on your screen and let yourself be recognized by our Zoom moderator. And once it is recognized, you may unmute your microphone so that you can ask your question to our resource speaker. So let me pass now the screen to our Zoom moderator, Sir John Paul, and to our Facebook moderator, Ma'am Miraflor. Sir John Paul. Hello, good afternoon, um, Sir Villiega, Sir Junel. There's a question from uh, Dr. De Las Yagas. Uh, she asks, how do you interpret gender integration in terms of differences in socioeconomic status like developed countries versus developing countries? All right, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Doc. Doctina, no? Actually, this is a very good question. No? We should uh, also take note that when we talk about gender and when we advocate gender, iba-iba yung pinaglalaban natin in the developing country and in developed economies. Okay, so in uh, underdeveloped economies, however, mas mahirap, no? Mas, uh, ano ba? Uh, it's more challenging. It's more difficult because women are marginalized. Uh, if women are marginalized in developed economies, women are more marginalized in underdeveloped economies. So in the Philippines, for example, we are very good. Actually, we rank number one in Asia in terms of gender and development efforts. However, we can always check, we can always assert, and we can always claim that gender bias still exists in 
in the community. So, of course, it's also good that we, we should check uh, social economic factors aside from the gender orientation. So how do we integrate that? Uh, well, we should uh, set uh, differences. Oh, number one, uh, uh, the very basic thing that we do in gender and development is first, sex disaggregated data. So we can now compare how many males and how many females. And when it comes to their social economic status, you can also check how many males are in the upper poverty threshold or in the lower poverty threshold and so on and so forth. So the very basic premise there is we should first check sex disaggregated data. And from then on, we could analyze this data in terms of socioeconomic lens or even in biological lenses. So I think uh, that's my answer. Thank you for that answer. Uh, there's another question, um, Sir Junel. Um, this time it's from uh, Dr. Jose Marie Ocdenaria. Um, he asked, how, how open are the, the school norms about gender equality, especially most religious sectarian schools? And how do we combat gender stereotypes in the campus where some of the teachers do stereotyping? Yeah, uh, this is an interesting question. How open are the school norms? Uh, we cannot really say uh, how, how, how open they are. It depends on the school that we are in. Uh, that is why we have the gender and development to advocate for that. Uh, the good thing about SOOCs, state universities and colleges is gender and development is a mandate. As a matter of fact, we are required to spend 5% of our total GAA budget for gender and development efforts. In private HEIs or private institutions, they are not required. No? They're encouraged, but they are not required. So meaning to say, that could also be a limiting factor to their efforts when it comes to gender and development. But as I have said, even with our efforts in, in the GAD Center, we can, we can always say that there are still biases around. No? That's why uh, in schools, we should check the instruction, curriculum, research, and extension, and even production when, when we talk about higher education institutions. We should check this four functions of an HEI and try to as much as possible integrate gender in, in these areas or in these fields of specialization. And I would like to agree with you, Doc Jomar, that there are really teachers, a lot of teachers who are stereotyping at schools. So how do we combat them? We should go into policies. Okay, uh, let, let's say policy on uniform. No? This is a big issue among educational institutions, whether we allow our students to cross-dress or not. And to tell you honestly, in the OSCSC, we are not allowing our students to cross-dress. So it's okay so long as the community does not see it as a problem and so long as you can justify your policy based on empirical data. Okay? So I think um, the, the, the best way to do away with stereotyping is to integrate it in the policy. Thank you. Okay. Another question from uh, Dr. Steele from Dr. Delesiagas. Would you consider some areas of the student handbook as gender biased? Example, males should have certain haircut, wearing of pants for, school, uh, for boys uniform and skirts for female students. Uh, yes. Yes and no, uh, depending on what lens we are using. So for, for a gender advocate, we could say that yes. Pero uh, the, th the good thing about gender and development kasi is uh, respect and compromise. So if it's written in the policy and it's based on certain, let's say in public schools or sectarian schools, it's based on certain values, social values, community values, 
then we're, we're fine with it. No? Meaning, it's okay so long as it's your policy and it's okay so long as there is no movement to change your policy. Okay, that's why it could also be a no because we could also explain like, for example, uh, wearing of skirts could be text-based rather than gender-based because of your physical structure, physiological, anatomical differences between men and, and women, then women are more likely or more natural to use skirts rather than females. So we could also view it from that lens. So the bottom line there, Doc, is actually, uh, it depends on the policy of the school. That's what, that's what we always say. In fact, uh, we have a student here, uh, I will not mention, but we have a case, we had a case several years ago uh, it's a student na hindi inalaw ng faculty to join a class because naka cross dress. And then we actually tried to resolve the matter and then advise the teacher na papasukin yung sudyante even though kasi para sa sudyante she is already a female. Pero hindi naman ang uniform hindi siya naka cross dress ang uniform. But during a uh, wash days na nagsusot ng skirt. So, the gender identity of the person now, of the student, is already a female. So, babae, mag-good ko, sir. So, di ko pwede mo suot. Ano siya? Di ko pwede mo suot o kaning pang lalaki. Kay babae, di ko sa ako ang paminaw. And we respect that. And we actually encourage the teacher to accept. The student was accepted, but later on, the student also decided to transfer to other institution na mas accepted siya. Kasi daw, kahit na inaccept na based on our recommendations na agiha po stereotyping when inside the class. So at the end of the day, ang daganan lang gihapon, uh, the bottom line the, the basis is our school policies. Okay, uh, another very good question Sir Sir Junel. Uh, this time it's from Sir Jimmy Ray Cabardo. Uh, he asked, can we totally eradicate gender bias and in inequality without compromising the order in schools or in society uh, and then because it seems that we are always or living always with it uh, it's the ideal way no it's the ideal thought that we will eradicate gender bias and inequality but of course it will always be there and that's why our efforts uh, our efforts should be continuous now as a matter of fact in one of my talk na, among high school teachers here in Mati, I, will, I was also asked, na, Sir, what's more important? Your God, meaning G-A-D, or my God, meaning G-O-D? So, so, so in response, I say, so what do you think of me, sir? I'm not a believer. Meaning to say, uh, the bottom line there is uh, respect. Na? And the bottom line there is we should understand that there are different gender orientations and we cannot do anything to eliminate these gender orientations. So if we cannot accept them, we just have to respect them. We respect their choices. And when we respect their choices, I think we are now uh, contributing to the development part of gender and development. I may ask Sir Junel, um, this time it's for, it's my question. Uh, what's the most difficult gender-related issue you have faced so far as a biology teacher and how did you manage to solve it or conquer it? Ah, okay, as a biology teacher. Well, uh, when I joined Gender and Development a few years ago, that's also my question because I'm a biology teacher, so what will I do with or what will I do under gender and development? What can I do in gender and development with the set of knowledge and skills that I have? So it remained actually a puzzle to me, even up to now. But although now I'm slowly realizing that gender and develop biology, uh, gender can be integrated into biology teaching. So I think the greatest challenge there is combating my own 
biases and stereotypes as well. Because even if I'm advocating God, I cannot do away with my bias, with my stereotypes. But you have to be sensitive. That's why if you cannot accept, just respect. So that's that's the takeaway message there. Thank you. Maybe um, the Facebook uh, Live have questions, uh, Sir Mira. Um, based on the feeds, there were no questions for from our FB viewers, but. I have a personal question as one of the God advocates in school. So it's um, common among, um, there are already promulgated guidelines, both in DepEd and CHAD, it's, pro it's provided. But facing the stereotyping as well as with uh, uh, the, po the school's policy, uh, we can't really fully implement it. So uh, as how would you, um, as a God um, advocate as well, how would, uh, can you give us um, additional, shall we say, push, or you do have some, uh, shall we say, legal basis that would also help us to fully or to arm or equip God advocates in implementing as well um, uh, or embracing um, gender and equality in our school? Thank you, Ma'am Mira. Okay, uh, additional push. <laughs> it should always start with analyzing or identifying the issues that are present in your school. Na? So what are the issues that you encounter? You list them down. Uh, list all of the issues that you encounter. And then from the issues, because that's basic in gender, God planning and budgeting. Okay, so number one, you identify the issues. And the next to it, you identify programs, projects, and activities that you can do to address these issues. So that is where your idea of, let's say, giving a seminar or giving a, a certain activity like Women's Day, that is where that thoughts will come in because you're now thinking of PPAs. And then from then on, it should be uh, budgeting. Na? So where do we get the budget? Na? This is the, the biggest question. Well, under the General Appropriations Act, GAA, 5% of the budget of government agencies should be spent to gender and development. So that's the legal basis that we, <laughs> that we should always tell to our supervisors, ma'am, because most of the time, they will... Uh, they will not approve our activities because we have no budget. When in the first place, we have a lot of budget because it's 5% of the GAA. So I think that's all that I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sir Janelle. So I guess there, would, uh, there were no further questions from FB. So I will be returning now the floor to Ma'am Ellen. Thank you, Mamira. Thank you, Sir Janelle, for answering the queries and also enlightening the mind of our participants. Okay, at this point, let us award virtually award the certificate, and may I call on Dr. Maria Cristina de las Liagas to award the certificate to our resource speaker. Thank you, Sir Janelle. That's very informative and actually it's something that we have to think about when it comes to practicing our profession and even our day-to-day -day lives. And so I would like to award this certificate of appreciation to Mr. Janelle P. Villegas for generously sharing his time and expertise as resource speaker on the topic Beyond the Study of Life, Gender Integration in the Teaching of Biology during the third webinar series of Bayota Davo chapter with the theme, Raising Awareness and Bridging the Gaps Toward Nation Building and Better Science Education. Given the 17th day of October, 2020 in Davo City, Philippines. Signed yours truly. And sir, please accept the virtual certificate. Uh, would you like to say a few words? All right, thank you very much, Doc Tina, no, for, 
for the certificate and actually for giving me the opportunity to share my knowledge about gender integration and the teaching of biology on this platform. Actually, when Doc Pina asked me to give a talk on gender and development, I was uh, challenged at the same time uh, nervous because this is my first time to, uh, to discuss in front of biology teachers in the region. But I took it as a challenge to me because this is an, this is an opportunity to uh, further spread our advocacy and our which has become my personal advocacy in my years of stay under the Gender and Development Center. So thank you very much, Bayota Davao, for, for the opportunity. I know this is something that we don't usually talk in Bayota. No? So this topic is, uh, we could say that this is off topic. <laughs> but uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope now you realize that even in a hard science discipline like biology, we can always incorporate gender and development, and we can always incorporate social perspectives. So at the end of the day, uh, this, will, this will challenge us to go beyond the study of life and to go beyond or, and to move down from our ivory towers and see what's really going on in our community and relate it in our day-to-day -day teaching activity. I know that we are all good in, in terms of teaching in our respective bragging ways, but uh, I hope that my talk also encouraged or sparked a little among us to also work on gender and development. Thank you very much and have a good day, everyone. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Tina and Sir Janelle. So at this point, let us hear the closing remarks from our Bayota Dava Chapters Public Relations Officer, Mr. Michael Dan A. Superior. Hi, um, good afternoon. So um, uh, this is, was a very informative talk about sex and gender and integrating gender sensitivity in teaching biology subjects. Well, um, being teachers, uh, we should be sensitive to the needs of our students because a good teacher, of course, knows what his or her, her students need. And um, this talk has provided us with good insights about this crucial subject in the modern classroom and very much in the society. So um, thank you very much, Sir Janelle, for sharing your knowledge in this field. We have learned so much from your talk and I am pretty much sure that as teachers, we will be integrating this into our teaching strategies in the future. And as people, we will be integrating gender sensitivity, equality, and respect in our every, everyday behavior towards others. Um, I was particularly drawn to your statement that teachers possess the ability and power to change social construct. It is a very powerful, powerful statement, which um, highlights our role as educators in raising and humanizing the next generation of people that will become functional members of the society. The, the conduct of these types of online seminars is what Bayota Davao aspire to do as an organization to continuously provide venues for holistic learning that will cater the needs of biology, biology teachers, students, and enthusiasts in Davao. Well, thank you, very, uh, thank you everyone for listening and we hope to see you in our next webinar episode. Okay, thank you, Sir Michael. So here is the working team of Bayota Davao chapter. And here are some of the announcements. So please do not forget to accomplish the evaluation form. And this is the link. It, it is um, pasted on the chat box and you may scan also the QR code. And please comply no, the evaluation form before you will receive the certificate. And also please be part of our organization, Bayota Philippines Davao Chapter. And you may, um, you may have the, that link in our Facebook page. And also catch our fourth webinar series this coming Saturday, October 24, 2020 at 2 to 3 p.m. And it is also live via Zoom. So it is a very interesting topic and very timely as well. So the, uh, the fourth webinar series is entitled Plastic Pollution, a Local Perspective on a Global Crisis. And it will be given by Ms. Cheris July Ross Adlawan, who is the project coordinator of Plastic Smart Cities WWF Philippines. 
So with that, I would like to thank you all for participating in this third webinar series of Biota Philippines Davao Chapter. So we hope to see you this Saturday for our fourth webinar series. So this has been your host together with Sir John Paul and Mamira. Thank you and God bless you all. So stay safe everyone and let's be challenged every day. Goodbye and God bless you all. Thank you. So my request everyone to stay long for 